Hey everyone, my name is Jacqueline Woodson and I am the author of my newest book is The Year We Learned to Fly, which is illustrated by Rafael Lopez. Um, and I'm an author and I'm very excited to be talking today with Shelly Williams. <laughs> Hi, I'm Shelly Williams. I am the author of Your Legacy, A Bold Reclaiming of Our Enslaved History, um, beautifully illustrated by Tanya Angel. And I am beyond excited to be talking with my very favorite author, Jacqueline Woodson. <laughs> Yay, Shelly. I, I love this book so much. I, I know I've told you this so many times, how much I love your legacy. And, um, and this is your first book. It is. Which is amazing that right out of the gate, it's, it's just so much power and story and what we need right now. So I was hoping we'd start with you reading from the beginning of it. I would, I would love to, uh, Jackie. One of the things that in writing this book, I was daunted with how to begin the story. And the very first line of the book sets the course. Um, Your story begins in Africa. Did you know Africans were the first people on earth? Africa is a continent that is home to many countries and many thriving nations. For thousands of years, Africans cultivated their land and grew many kingdoms that were passed down from generation to generation. They dreamt of the day their land would be passed down to you. So that for me was the frame of the entire book. It was, where do we begin to talk about our enslaved ancestors, not on the shores of the Americas, but actually in, in Africa, where they were free, where they were thriving, where they were innovating, where they spoke multiple languages, where multiple cultures learned and shared with each other, um, and where they had dreams of passing down their legacies to, their, to, their ne to the next generations. And then how it all changed. Wow, it's, it's, it's such an important place to begin to. I was thinking about as you were reading when I was in, I think I was in fourth or fifth grade when we first started learning about slaves. And, and I remember always having so much shame as a black kid in the classroom. And, and that was supposedly where my story began, right? And, and not, not even as enslaved people, right? Where right. Um, where it was, the onus wasn't on us. It was because someone stole us from our homeland and decided they wanted to own our bodies. Um, and so when we, I started learning about the history before enslavement, it was so important to me to understand that, yeah, that there was a before period to this moment here. And, and this country is very young. And, and so I love that you start with that period where, where we were able to be whole people um, yeah. and thriving. I, I what made book, you, oh, sorry. Go no, I was gonna say, I, you know, I thought I was writing this book for my children, but I really ended up writing a lot of this book for me because I learned so much that I have to say, embarrassingly, I did not know. Dots I didn't put together until, until I started researching this book. You know, when I saw our ancestors in movies and TV shows depicted speaking broken English. I, I thought it was because they were ignorant. Mm -hmm. and, and I did not ever piece together that they spoke their own languages fluently. I, I did not get from my, you know, from our history books in school that they were deprived of learning and that they created languages so they could communicate together. I, I never, heard the celebration of their, their intelligence. And so I, this book really did a lot of healing for me when I wrote it. Uh, I just um, watched Descendants. Have you seen that? Which is a beautiful documentary about, um, the, the, about the last illegal ship of, um, of enslaved people to come to this country. Um, but I was just thinking about um, Barracoon and that whole story was or Neil Hurston's last um, 
she actually went in and interviewed this descent, this um, one of the last enslaved people. And it's just such a beautiful story. Um, so I have a question for you. Um, what, how are you feeling? I think that's my first question. How, how does it feel to have a book in the world? Uh, you've done so much other amazing stuff and, and we'll get to talking about that, but like, how does it feel physically to turn around and see your legacy, this, this thing that started in your head in the world and making an impact? I, I can, I, it's so hard. I'm like speechless if <laughs> you talk about it. I remember the first time I actually saw the book was someone had got an early copy before me and posted some pages online. And I literally started shaking. I had both a super vulnerable feeling and then I was overwhelmed that I felt like I was birthing something, you know, and something that people were gonna judge. They're gonna have opinions about my child. <laughs> so I felt both really excited and, and very vulnerable at the same time. Um, and, and as I, you know, the first time I, I saw the illustrations, it was so incredible because Tanya's vision, when she read the words, what she brought to it was so beyond my imagination. It had so much depth and so much, so many layers. And I, couldn't believe that the words could inspire something so beautiful. And I remember when we were talking about illustrators and you know, for, the, for people who don't know the process, authors and illustrators don't talk at all during the process, you know, during the whole making of the book. I remember thinking, I really want a black mother to illustrate this book because if we're not gonna ever have a conversation, I want her to know what this means. And so I, I couldn't be happier with the elegance of it and, and how beautiful every black person in the book is, because that was important to me too, that my children see beautiful, thriving black people, innovative black people on every page. So it, it's, um, you know, my baby is about six months old and it still feels new and exciting. And, um, and I feel, very blessed that that you know abrams took a chance and and it's here in the world uh, that's so awesome i i'm sorry i know you're gonna you have questions for me but i have so many for you so you might not get to the ones for me what is uh, next to the day you begin poster what is that um picture it's a picture of a, it looks like a high school yearbook um photo that's black and white oh that one yeah do you remember uh -huh. it yep yeah. so this, um, well, I was in the original company of Aida at the oh. Palace Theater, and a friend of mine, Franny, did pictures, like our playbill pictures, and she drew them all, and that's me right there. Oh, wow. That's amazing. So it's something yeah. that I, I really cherish, and everybody signed it. So it has, you know, Heather Headley and Adam Pascal and Sherry Vinnie Scott and all the stars, the original wow. company. Wow. Yeah. Can you tell the um, circle and broken story of Aida? What's happening now? <laughs> yeah. So um, years ago, a little 21 years ago, we opened Aida on March 23rd, 2000. And I was, I played the role of Nehebka in the show. And here it is 21 years later, I am directing the revival of Aida. And yesterday I was actually doing Zoom auditions. Um, and it is, I think we are anticipating six companies around the world and looking forward to the show finally making its West End debut. So it, it's, it's pretty full circle and pretty extraordinary. And that wow. story, I have to say, is very much in keeping with this story. We are reclaiming our history. We are telling uh, a, a more truthful, and realistic version of Nubia and really um, and really highlighting what an extraordinary country it was. It was not a diminished small country next to Egypt. It was a four, you know, it, it, an incredible country. And so we are telling a more um, realistic and an honest version of our history. 
Wow. Um, for the young people who don't know the story of Aida, can you say a little bit more about it? Yes. Uh, the story of Aida is about three people who were destined to take over their country. Aida is destined to take over Nubia, and she ends up uh, becoming enslaved by an Egyptian warrior who is uh, betrothed to an Egyptian princess, uh, and he falls in love with Aida, uh, to, you know, the enemy. And it's about how they navigate both their love and their challenges of what their destinies are and the bold choices they make to forge a new future. Mm, wow, it's, it's so in line with your legacy. Yeah, indeed. So oh, great. And when you were talking about um, the birthing a baby and putting it in the world, the thing about when you actually have a new child, people don't say stuff to your face about what's wrong with it. <laughs> <laughs> which is a scary thing about writing a book, right? You actually get to hear and see the criticisms of, of yeah. your labor. Yes. Um, so, so I don't know, I'm sure you have been following the way literature is being challenged, especially the literature of black and brown folks um, in school communities and in, in school systems. Um, and, um, your legacy is a book that would be challenged at this point because um, one of the things people are saying about what the challenge is about is that books make white children feel bad because they talk about the true history of this country and they talk about the lives of black and brown folks without referencing white people. What would mm -hmm. you say about that? I would say that it is time for us to start telling more uh, whole versions of our history. Um, because our children are walking away with something woefully incomplete and they're walking into the world with uh, incomplete knowledge and it's not level to the rest of the world. The rest of the world are reading these books. The rest of the world is going to college much more prepared in understanding the world, understanding culture, understanding our patterns as human beings better. I think that children hear a lot of stories that challenge what they believe and how they see the world. We must tell those stories. And, and I, don't, uh, I don't quite understand how a child can look at a story that is not about anything they did and assume the responsibility of it. I saw a lot of stories when I was, you know, younger about, you know, people that were cruel and, and people that, you know, did all kinds of things. And I never once thought, oh, that's me. I could look at the behavior. I could, I could say, I don't ever want to do that. Or I understand the impact of that behavior. But I never assumed that that child was me or that adult was me. So I think that's a, that's a false argument. Um, but I really do believe that anytime we're trying to deprive our children of education, we are failing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the, I remember some, I was in a barber shop and the barber asked the guy who's here, he was cutting, he's like, um, do you want your children to be smarter than you are? He's like, no, my kids can't be smarter than me. And he's like, of course you want your kids to be smarter than you are. Um, that's, you know, that's part of the journey to creating a better world and better human beings is, yeah. is um, enlightenment. And so the idea that we would want young people to stay ignorant because we didn't want to have certain conversations with them is, is surprising to me. I, I think if you love young people, you do want them to have all the information to make their own decision to make wise decisions. And it's so true that we're not just looking at ourselves in this country. I remember I was at a school and <clears throat> I was at a panel in Michigan and this woman said that she, she taught at an all white school. And so she had never used my books because they weren't relevant 
vent to her kids. And I thought, oh, please don't let me be the first black person these kids meet because they're all gonna be like, wait, what is that? And this idea that your young people are going to stay in this small space all of their lives and that, that they're never gonna leave this country is interesting, right? That they're never gonna leave their, their state, their city is very, it's heartbreaking. It's a way of thinking very small about someone who can be so much bigger. And also that they're never gonna visit the internet, right? They're never right. gonna use a computer. Well, I mean, that's, so. that's kind of the amazing thing is like, when you tell a child, don't do something, it's the first thing they're gonna do. It's like, you basically created the book list that every child is gonna read by saying, whatever you do, do not open that door. I was like, wow. Well, <laughs> That's all the kids are going to want to read from now on. Um, but, but not, you know, the, the heartbreaking thing, as you said, is, is that we are not encouraging our children to be curious. We're not encouraging conversations that can sometimes be difficult, but often become illuminating. We're not opening our hearts. We're encouraging them to close their hearts and minds. So it, it is the opposite to me of how we nurture and grow. And I think that even if I, my child reads something that I disagree with, it's an opportunity for me to engage. So I, I never fear a question that someone asks me. I can lean into the curiosity and we can, you know, and if I don't have the answer, I can find the answer. Um, but I, I want my kids, like you said, to go beyond. And, and that's, you know, the thing that I love about you as an author is, when I was raising my daughters, I knew that there is literally a Jacqueline Woodson book for every phase of their life, right? <laughs> so I, I knew if there was a conversation that I wanted them to have, I knew if I wanted them to see themselves authentically, I knew that if I wanted them to be curious, that they would read one of your books and they would find that. You know, I always go back to each kindness because that book ended and I was like, wait, what? <laughs> But when you want to talk about having a conversation with children about empathy and, and them really understanding that at the end of the day, perhaps it doesn't get tied up in a bow, that there is consequence. That's an extraordinary book about reality. And for them to understand the responsibility of their actions and the impact those actions can have. So, I, you know, I, I'm so excited about your latest book, the year we learned to fly um, because, you know, yet again, you have found something so extraordinarily timely because it, there was no way to prepare our children for this pandemic. And yet your book has come out in a moment when they need resilience the most. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk about yeah. your, uh, you know, where this came from and the process and, uh, what it means now versus what it means when you began it? Oh man, that's such a great question. Um, it's 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 kind of uncanny the timeliness of it, right? Like I, when I started writing the year we learned to fly, I I never dreamed that children would have to imagine themselves out of such a particular moment, right? Which is this right. pandemic and how heartbreaking it was to see. I remember doing a Zoom with a reading group and there was one, so everyone had their cameras on. It was before young people started turning their cameras off, but, um, but everyone had their cameras on. And there was this one little girl and she was in the bathroom sitting beside, between the toilet bowl and the, the roll of toilet paper. And that's, that's where she was able to have privacy in her house you know so obviously her apartment was that small or had that many people in it that she had to take this really physically small space to be able to engage in this book engage with me and and imagine something bigger and I feel like um I had already started writing the year we learned to fly and I was thinking about Virginia Hamilton's the people could fly and I was thinking about our experiences the way in which as um um, people of the global majority, we've always had to do the work to get out of some particular situation that was not of our doing, enslavement, Jim Crow, you know, there have always been these moments where we had to do that kind of work. And so, um, and how 
so it was so hard for me to imagine someone like the um, freedom singers getting on a bus and then that bus mm -hmm. getting bombed, right? Or knowing that they were gonna ride that bus into a place where they were gonna get spat at and shot at and all of these things. But I started thinking it must be the mind, right? You, it, it, The mind is the place where you can be your freest, where you can be your strongest, where you can make the bravest decisions. Um, and so I started writing this book to show myself first, which is, you know, I, I'm sure the same with you for your legacy, to show the sh that we have power, to show myself I have power in this situation where at times I feel like I've lost my way. Um, but look, going back to the ancestors, going back to Virginia Hamilton's, um, the people could fly where enslaved people flew across the water back to their homeland. I remember reading that as a younger person and thinking, wow, this is something, right? To imagine that could happen, right? And, and it doesn't have to be obviously physically lifting our bodies out mm -hmm. and over the water, but they lifted their mind. They didn't have, let their minds be enslaved. Um, and when Raphael came with the illustrations, one thing that he talks about is how he, you know, you can, he never had, from the beginning of the book, you don't see them actually flying, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're in movement, they're imagining it, you can see them kind of lifting off the ground, but uh, the, the reader probably wouldn't believe it if these kids lifted up into the air. So it's not until the very end where they have wings, but what he does show is he shows a bird flying and he shows a butterfly and those are the symbols for their own freedom. Um, but but again, with the illustrator, like, and not being able to talk to them, and then them giving you the gift of something that's more beautiful than you could have imagined, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> with, with the words that you've written. So, so it was definitely a journey. And then we were in a pandemic. <laughs> I was like, oh man, maybe you need to stop writing because maybe something's going on with the connection of your writing in the world that's making things happen. So I was like, no, I didn't mean this kind of freedom. But but of course, it, it, the, I think the books happen when we need them to happen, right? I think the same for your legacy. It, it's, a, it's a moment that we need right now. And it's a very grounding moment to, sh to um, have a conversation with young people about their strength and their history. And I, I, I totally believe that once we have that history, no one can take it away from us. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm very proud and very happy of the year we learned to fly. I'm glad it's in the world. I don't read reviews, so um, I, that's a lie. I read good reviews. You know, I don't, I don't read bad reviews because there's nothing I can do. I can't go back and rewrite the now. book. So yeah, so, <laughs> and, and it's not going to teach me anything about the next book I write because I, um, I'm not gonna write the year we learned to fly again. So, um, so I, I think I, I'm a, I'm a firm believer of, you know, just keep moving on to the next place and, um, and, and have the experience of writing that book. Um, so, so what's next for you? Well, I am, you know, I've started my next book and I am grappling with the perspective to tell it from. And what has been incredible for me is that I'm sitting in this place of uncomfort and I'm just, I'm like, I'm just going to sit in this. I'm not going to check a box and say, I got it done because I know that the children that are in this book have something to say and I just need to listen and I need to just sit in this place until their words authentically come out. So I know what the book is going to be about because it's about uh, an incredible moment where my children, and I think children all around the world, learned their purpose of standing for their own lives, of what it means when you have to stop being a child and start to march for your life. You know, when you, you know, I, I had the, the uncomfortable conversation with my children about how different the world was for them. And they couldn't turn away. The entire world was watching. I couldn't stop crying in front of them. 
you know, as much as I tried to shield them, this was a moment where I had to say, your black life is different. And so this book is about that and, and a book about how they find their voice. And so I am, I am finding my voice inside it as well. Oh, wow. I love that. I, I love that. Um, I mean, I love your girls. They're so brilliant and so beautiful and they're gonna so be okay. <laughs> they're gonna help us be okay. I mean, they're, they're such leaders already. Um, but to be uncomfortable inside the creation of the narrative, I think that's so important. <laughs> and, and, and I know young people experience it every day with trying to just get words on the page. You know, what people see is they see this finished book, right? And they mm -hmm. see the, the um, they, don't, they don't see the journey of the thrown away pages and the crossed out words. <laughs> and I, I think that's hair important. Pulling out. I think it's, you know, I think it's important for adults to show that, you know, show their children that they struggle too, mm -hmm. that they have a hard time, that they, that they have disappointment. We have to normalize the full range of emotions because when they have them, they have to recognize that it's normal for them to have them too. Yeah. So yeah. I, I'm very quick to say to the girls, you know, I thought I had it and then I didn't have it and I'm really frustrated. <laughs> I'm sitting in this place and and I've certainly, as you know, you know, sent you some texts and been like, Jackie, <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> but, but I am, I, I'm really excited because I am showing them that, that it takes work and that things don't come quickly. You know, sometimes, you know, your legacy kind of poured out of me because it was a conversation I had been trying to have for three years. So by the time I got it on paper, it had been a journey. And so, you know, really sitting inside this journey is, is something I'm just surrendering to. Um, I do want to talk to you, Jackie, because there is a theme that is in your books that has been so empowering for me. And that is the ancestors and what they continue to pass down to us. You know, when I read Show Way, I then went on my own journey to learn more about my own family and ask questions that I hadn't asked. Mm. You know, I had never gone beyond what I had been told. I was like, hey, who is, and then who was, and then what did they do? And then, you know, you, you continue to bring back for us our ancestors and their gifts. And, and how is that gonna thread for you in your life and in your books? Uh. It's so it's such a good question for those of you who don't know. Shelly is directing Shelly at the Kennedy Center, and I couldn't be more excited because your eye, your beauty, your social justice, your grace, everything that you're bringing, your patience, the kindness with um, which you engage with the actors and 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 the people at the KC, all of it. it I'm, I'm learning. I am I am learning from you. It's it's um. You know, I, I started Shoei when I was pregnant with Toshi, when I was um, pregnant with my daughter. Um, and I had lost my grandmother. My grandmother had always been like, you know, when is one, we ha I have three other siblings and she's like, when is someone gonna give me great grandchildren? And Which I always thought was kind of greedy because she had grandchildren. <laughs> like, and, and so, um, and so I, I, I said, I will. And, and she's like, no, you got to get married first. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. But I, I plan to have kids. Um, and then um, I think it was about three months before I got pregnant with Toshi, my grandmother died. And, and I wanted to have a connection between the two of them. And so I started with thinking about that. What could I, what could I tell my daughter about where she is on this line? Um, and, and so I knew I was going to go from Georgiana to Marianne to myself to Toshi. And then I remembered my great grandmother, Suni. And then I just started going back and researching and realizing that, you know, she came from this long line of women who had been doing some kind of work toward getting her here in this space on earth in a freer way. Um, and so, and it was heartbreaking because at one point in the book, we talked about this, I have um, history went and lost her name years later, Suni came. And that's Suni's mother whose name we don't have, like we, you know, we can't find anywhere. 
and and what was hard for, I, I thought of putting in a fake name and and then mm -hmm. I thought no let the let the record show that we lost a lot because of enslavement. You know, we lost our family history. I've been reading about Ida B. Wells and her mother, you know, for her life search for her siblings that had been had been sold away. And she, you know, that Ida B. was born enslaved and, and her parents had been enslaved. Ida um, B. Wells was, um, you know, emancipated at three months, I think. But, um, but here's this woman whose family got sold away and she never saw them again. And that kind of history is important to know that um, that there's a through line to so much of what's happening now. But but it, it was a heartbreaking journey. It was also a very healing one to write that book. And I, I, I'm glad I did it. It's extraordinary when you talk about the loss of names. That was a it was a big, a big theme in my book because when I was in junior high, I uh, was asked to do uh, a family tree. And I did my family tree and I was so proud of my family tree and I put it up on the wall and then everyone's were like all in the hallway and mine was so small. Mm. And something that I was so proud of, I suddenly felt so inferior. And so when I was writing this book, I wanted to empower black kids who've lost the names and the, you know, like it just, I, I can't go anywhere beyond a certain date. And so part of what we did, instead of giving fake names to the ancestors, is we just named the qualities that they gave to yes, us. Yes. And so, you know, one of the, the very last image of the book is this. And instead of having, you know, the, the family tree and all the limbs like they typically are, I made our ancestors the roots. Wow. And I named yeah. them the qualities that they passed down to us because I couldn't give them the names that their parents had given them or would have given them. But I mm -hmm. could talk about what they have given us. So the, the, what you keep weaving in, even in the year we learned to fly, is this connection between the resilience of our ancestors and the gifts that they have given to us. And I know you have another book coming out in the spring. I do, I do. It's 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 a much more playful book. I'm so excited for it. Um, the world belongs to us, and it's it's about play. It's about joy, and it's 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 what I needed to write after the year we learned to fly. Um, just to remember, remember joy. You know, remember the way we played and we were physically engaged with each other, and um, and we laughed and we found things like boxes to play with, right? So it's all those small things that. And that kept us going as children. It, it was really fun. Um, I, I, I think we're running out of time, but I wondered if you could just end um, by um, reading the, the, the nine words on the last page and I could just hold it up so people see this beautiful illustration. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> Can I, I'm gonna read the, the, the page before. Okay. Which says, you are meant to do great things. Walk tall, hold your head high, and change the world. Love, brilliance, ingenuity, courage, strength, intellect, determination, dignity, and grace. Thanks, Shelley. Thanks so much for the gift of this beautiful book and this conversation. Oh, Can't wait thank to see you in you. person. Oh, thank you for, for continuing to inspire us. And yet again, even with your new book, you are meeting us right where we are with joy, <laughs> you know, and play and exactly where we want to be in the spring. There's going to be a beautiful book that reminds us of who we are and the joy that we seek. So thank you for, you know, constantly being there for me as a writer and as a friend. Always. You need your writing community. Yes. <laughs> Got you. <laughs>